Video game history is usually referred to very specifically by console generation, or very broadly by determining whether something is retro or not, which is almost always the incorrect use of the word retro. In this video, I'm just thinking about how eras might be defined more broadly in the future, similar to how comic historians divide the history of comic books. And to be more specific, I mean eras in the broad sense, like gold and silver, bronze, modern. Not the ones where they go into the nitty gritty like Atomic Age, Copper Age, Movie Age. Hot plug, we discussed this on episode 92 of the Collector's Quest podcast, and I had the minority opinion there, but now I'm on my own YouTube channel and no one's here to disagree with me. So why even think about this? Well, it's not like there's a governing body of video game history, so discussions from random people are the only way to start shaping how people are going to think about these things in the future. But why eras? Periods in gaming history are usually tied to home console hardware releases. Which isn't all video games. There were video games before the Magnavox Odyssey, and that period should be classified. There are arcade and PC and mobile games that shaped gaming history more than the launch of the Atari Jaguar. Heck, Minecraft is probably the most important game of the last decade. It's a 2011 PC game that's been ported to everything from Android to Switch. What console generation did that impact? And I know the answer is both, but that's not my point. The Nintendo Switch is currently considered part of the 8th generation of consoles, at least according to Wikipedia editors. But the new Xbox and PlayStation are coming out, and, well, Switch isn't on the same hardware upgrade cycle, but it's almost definitely going to compete with them. So I guess it's going to be considered part of both console generations, even though it's technically an 8th generation console? It, it, it's very strange. Also, while overlaps in historical periods are fine, I don't think there has to be a specific cutoff date from one era to another, one generation to another, the overlap in console generations is just ridiculous sometimes. There's a number of 15 year periods that are just stacked on each other every five years. On the other side of this problem is the term retro. First of all, it doesn't make any sense, and in an ideal world, people should just stop using it, but I know that's not gonna happen. Retro means imitative of a style of the recent past. It doesn't mean something that's old. Shovel Knight is retro. A correct word to describe Atari games would be vintage. But terminology aside, lumping old games together as old is not very specific. If I say vintage movies or old movies, Casablanca probably pops into your head before Gladiator. Everyone has a different definition of what old is, whether it's 10 or 20 years, however many console generations back, or like it cuts off at 3D gaming and it never changes with time, whatever. No matter how you cut it, if you're lumping Atari with Xbox or PlayStation with 1970s PC games, it's too nonspecific at this point to really mean that much. So for multiple reasons, the term retro gaming and trying to divide gaming into what's new and what's old is just something that drives me crazy. So hopefully that explains my argument for categorizing things into eras rather than generations or retro. Now, game history almost always starts by trying to define what a video game even is. So what is a video game? Well, it's not an electronic game. It's not an electromechanical game. Those are their own thing. It has to have a screen of some kind. So in the 1950s, there are mainframes that play tic-tac-toe, nim, and checkers. Of course, there's Tennis for Two, played on an oscilloscope. And we go up through about Space War in 1962, which was one of the first widespread things clearly recognizable as a video game. Games are kind of a formless void at this point. It's the primordial ooze, and genres barely exist outside of the genres of traditional games and sports. Despite the years, game projects have little influence over each other, because for the most part, games are isolated to their individual labs with a giant-ass computer. Games are programmed by engineers and physicists and computer scientists for research or personal amusement. Space War wasn't something normal people played at the time. It spread through universities and computer labs that had access to PDP computers. The concept of selling computer games or video games was not even on the map yet. I think most people would agree we can just call this entire period the early history of video games, which almost every source does. There are a few possible cutoff dates to this era. In late 1971, Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney released Computer Space, the first arcade game and first commercially sold video game. In 1972, Ralph Baer's Magnavox Odyssey was released, the first home video game console. And in late 72 through 73, Al Alcorn's Pong was released, which was the first commercially successful video game. And perhaps, if you really want to, Super Mario Bros. in 1983 or 1985. That's the cutoff and everything below this, early arcade, early 8-bit consoles, it's all part of that formless void primordial ooze, which I'll remind you includes giant room-sized computers that play checkers. 
This was really the only main point we disagreed on when dividing up eras of gaming history on the podcast. And you know, now that I'm talking about it, there's probably even one more point that people might argue is the cutoff point, and that would be the golden age of arcades. You could probably start that with Space Invaders in 1978. Although really the golden age of arcades was another five or so year period, so it has the same specificity problem of just defining a console generation, I think. So personally, I wouldn't do that. If you ask me what the most critical point is, the point where early video game history ends, in my non-console-centric view, it's computer space in 1971. It's the product that created the video game industry. This is when video games went from programmer diversions and research to the real deal thing that regular people like you and me could play. And Odyssey and Pong are obviously incredibly important as well, so if you really want to, we can blur the cutoff date from 1971 through 1973, and that's the first real era, the early history of video games. Now, Super Mario Bros. is probably the most important game in history. It certainly helped save the gaming industry, but it didn't create it. So here's my controversial idea that got me shit on the podcast. I think Atari, through NES, through Super Nintendo, all belong in the same era. Now, you could easily say Odyssey through NES was home video games' first shot. It was weird, it was Pong, it was a lot of space games, we were figuring out how genres even worked, the industry collapsed under its own excess, then Mario saved the day and ushered in a new era. And you'd be totally right, but instead, I'm gonna say that the most obvious cutoff point for an era in probably all of video games is not the cutoff point. So here's my bird's eye view. 1971 through the mid 90s is when 2D video game genres were defined. And while 80s computers and home consoles really expanded upon the genesis of each genre, and the 16-bit era generally took the concepts of the 8-bit era and improved upon them, these 25 or so years are all about space shooters and platform games and adventure games and RPGs, all essentially growing up from an idea through technology and game design advancements into the most recognizable forms of those genres, which in a lot of cases I would say are either the 8 or 16-bit versions of 2D games. Let's look at platform games. Super Mario Bros. It isn't the start of the story, it's the middle. In 1980, we have Space Panic, but we can't even jump in that game, forget it. So in 1981, we have Donkey Kong. You can jump! This changes everything. This is a video game genre, a single screen platform game. In 1982, Pitfall, interconnected screens, dodging enemies, and jumping obstacles. This becomes the prototype for the entire genre. A couple years later, we have games like Impossible Mission and Pitfall 2. The game is no longer a line, it's a grid of horizontal and vertical rooms full of exploration. These games have stories, objectives, and endings. It's not just about getting a high score anymore. Then, in 1985, Super Mario Bros. Not the first scrolling platformer, but obviously the one that all other platform games would seek to become for all the reasons you already know. And not to belabor the point, skipping ahead, Mario 3 adds world map, it expands on level design, Sonic makes everything fast, Super Mario 64 took everything into 3D and basically changed every single aspect of the genre into an exploration adventure collecting game. Okay, hold up. This is clearly something different now. This is not the evolution of a genre, this is a new genre. But everything before this, Space Panic through Sonic 3 and Knuckles, or if you're really gonna complain about the single screen games, Pitfall to Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Those are clearly cut from the same cloth. That's one video game genre. This, to me, is what defines this era of video games. For RPGs, we've got mainframe text-based D&D games, where we basically crib the rules of D&D and defined the concept of a boss. Bam! Temple of Abshai, we have graphics. Ultima, we've got an overworld with dungeons and random battles. Ultima leads to Dragon Quest in 1986, which more or less would be what Eastern RPGs would be for decades to come. Dragon Quest leads into Final Fantasy with classic side view battles. Fantasy Star 2 combines elements of all these previous games with an epic character-driven story. And then Final Fantasy VII not only shifts the genre into 3D, but it adds CG cutscenes that are blended into the gameplay, and like many early 3D games, it becomes one of the most influential games of all time. Now, it's not as hard of a stop as Super Mario 64, which is basically a different genre from Super Mario World. And I mean, RPGs still carry so much DNA from their 1970s and especially 1980s roots. But peeking ahead at history, Final Fantasy VII clearly defined a new era of JRPGs. I'm not gonna go through every video game genre, I know everyone watching this video knows the stories, but all the 2D genres, or most of them, basically went from birth to their most recognizable final form from the 70s to about the mid-90s. From Scramble to R-Type to Space Megaforce, Heavyweight Champ to Yi-R Kung Fu to Street Fighter II, 
Utopia to SimCity, all of those shitty turbo pole position and outrun clones, basically everything before virtual racing, I'm sure there was some kind of order to that. And look, it's not 100% perfect. The turning point in sports games was probably John Madden football in the late 80s. I would not say Pong, ice hockey, and John Madden football are cut from the same cloth. Madden is clearly this revolutionary new thing, but you're not going to find a single sensible cutoff date for every single genre as games were shifting to 3D. Technology was just moving too fast and too disparately. So when does the 2D era end and the 3D era begin? Obviously you can point to a bunch of obscure or primitive 3D games as the roots of 3D gaming, but we're defining the entire era here. You're not going to tell me the 3D era starts with the release of something like Jumping Flash, and you're certainly not going to tell me that like Battlezone is the first 3D game so we should extend it back that far. I think there are two clear choices here, Doom in 1993 and Super Mario 64 in 1996. Both games are so absurdly influential, I'm not even going to choose between them, we're just going to do the fuzzy cutoff thing again. Some genres like virtual racing or alone in the dark made the transition slightly earlier, and some genres like Tomb Raider came slightly later, but I don't think there's any argument that once games moved to 3D, everything changed. Again, this era is absolutely defined by the creation and refinement of new video game genres, so I'm just going to call it the 3D era of video games. First person shooter, third person shooter, survival horror, 4x strategy, collectathon platformers, multimedia adventure games like Myst and The Seventh Guest, whatever the hell Blast Core was, simply put, new shit was possible, and just like the days of Atari 2600, we didn't really have the best idea of what to do anymore. And people were just throwing shit at the wall to see what stuck. Remember vehicular combat games like Twisted Metal and Vigilante 8 and Cell Damage? That almost became like an entire genre, but then we kind of collectively forgot about all those after this era, and it didn't live on past this. Do you want a genre where you dance in real life? BAM! Arcades are back, baby! What's that? Oh, they're dying again just a few years later? Oh well, I thought it was worth a shot. Diablo, in 1996, it has such a revolutionary interface that it co-opted an entire genre name, the action RPG. Before, you used to call something like Zelda an action RPG. Now, it's an action-adventure game. Oh yeah, the analog stick exists now, I guess. And you can move your mouse to look around in first person. This era also had the most nonsensical controller designs as we tried to figure out 3D, before we all eventually decided that the Xbox Controller S is essentially the most comfortable controller design and we're all just going to use that going forward. Except for Sony, of course, because their original DualShock design with the tacked-on analog sticks on the bottom is just too iconic to change even if ergonomically, they make no sense. There was also a revolution in video game narrative throughout this era. Traditional gameplay was mixed with epic scale cutscenes in games like Metal Gear Solid and Final Fantasy VII. Half-Life told this narrative through the gameplay itself, starting out as a normal day at work and then never leaving the first person perspective or switching to a pre-rendered cutscene. Deus Ex was a pioneer in branching paths, and a pioneer in how many times I said it out loud as a kid when I saw it on Best Buy shelves, because I thought it was pronounced do sex. So here's another maybe controversial cutoff point, I'm not sure. Grand Theft Auto 3, the game that clearly changed everything. Huge open-ended gameplay, lengthy narrative, it's all in 3D now, it's the game. The first time I played it, I crossed the bridge, I got into whatever car happened to be there in 3D, just like all the other GTA games, but this time I could not believe what was happening in 3D. It was probably the most jaw-dropping moment I can remember in a video game. I mean, before this we had Driver, where you basically are a car, and now you can walk around and drive any car. Anyway, like with Super Mario Bros., I'm sticking GTA 3 right in the middle of this era. Because the next era of video games, the modern era of video games, it's not going to be defined by the emergence of new genres anymore. The modern era of video games is defined by the way games are consumed. Narrative was clearly a growing influence on this era of video games, however it almost certainly wasn't the main draw to a game, except RPGs because the gameplay in all those is super boring as shit. If you go back and play games from this era, which really aren't that old, something that sticks out immediately is the ability to lose. Games are much longer now, so they won't send you back to the beginning, but many games still use the concept of lives and continues. Games have no problem making you start at the beginning of a level after you die with no checkpoints. And remember the driver tutorial stage? It was probably the hardest part of the game, the tutorial! 
If you only play the Crash Bandicoot remakes, which let you save after the end of every level, you might not remember that the original game only had save points every few levels. So if you lost all your lives and had to continue, you would have to play multiple levels over again. When Metal Wolf Chaos was re-released, a game that's only about 15 years old, modern reviews often complained that there's no mid-level checkpoints and the levels are only like 10 minutes long. Making the player get good at a particular segment or figure out a difficult puzzle is virtually considered bad game design now. Anyway, you get the idea. I have a whole video on the concept of gameplay-focused games compared to content tourism, and these 3D games clearly aren't content tourism. If you want to define the eras differently, you might say that the 2D era is the gameplay era. The 3D era is the blending of gameplay with narrative, and the modern era is the content tourism era. Although personally, I think the perspective-based genre differences are bigger than the narrative differences, at least for these two eras. So where does it all change this time? I said in a previous video that I'd pinpoint it to the Elder Scrolls Oblivion, but okay, I know that's kind of a weird place, so let's just say the launch of the Xbox 360 a few months earlier in 2005. Which, now that I'm saying it out loud, like, why would this even be controversial? Like, who would pick GTA 3 over Xbox 360's launch as the roots of the modern video game era? That makes so much less sense. Console graphics jumped to HD, PC graphics and AI made huge leaps forward. Honestly, perhaps the last quantum leap forward that we've seen yet, with games like Fear and Crisis. Nintendo started a string of hardware decisions where they broke off from the mainstream and clearly just started doing whatever they wanted to with the DS, the Wii, the Wii U, the 3DS, and the Switch. But the orgy of technological advancements aside that clearly set this generation as the start of a new era comes back to the question of how we define a start point. What is a video game? Games really split off in two distinct directions here. Frequently games became guided narrative experiences that take the player on a journey through a world and take gameplay obstacles away from the player so that they can just enjoy the ride. It's almost consumed like a movie. Or games maintain more traditional gameplay focus, your Dark Souls, your Sekiro's, your Celeste's, and all that. I've compared this before to an audiobook versus a comic book. They're both ways to consume a story, but they're not at all the same thing. One is a passive experience that just kind of happens to you, and the other is an active reading experience where you flip back and forth through the pages, study the details of the art, and can read at your own pace. Similarly, video games in my opinion have sort of split off into two different mediums experienced through the same interface. The Elder Scrolls Oblivion was the first game that really slapped me in the face with this gameplay design. And it's not like these were the first quest markers ever. GTA 3 had quest markers. In fact, all the GTA games do. So it wasn't exactly a big change for the series. Look, I love Oblivion. Oblivion plays nothing like Morrowind. In Oblivion, the prevailing way to play was to go around, talk to everyone, to absolutely load up on quests, and then click a quest in my quest guide and follow the quest marker to wherever the game wanted to take me. Unlike Morrowind, I didn't have to think, I didn't have to pay attention to the rows or the signs, and I certainly didn't have to keep a journal or add markers to my map to keep track of what I wanted to do. The game just kind of plays itself so long as you're following that green arrow. The mere presence of it on the screen means that I'm often looking at my compass more than I'm looking at my surroundings. I could draw a rough roadmap of Morrowind from memory, but I certainly don't know the paths and the landscape of Cyrodiil. Dead Space was another big one I remember, a couple years later in 2008. There's a dedicated button on the controller that just draws a line telling you where to go. I remember laughing at the time at how ridiculous that seemed, and the fact that that wouldn't even seem slightly out of place now tells me that this is where games changed into the modern era. In 2005, Forza Motorsport included a driving line that would become a standard for the series, a feature which shows you exactly which line to take and how much to accelerate or brake. This feature is now turned on by default in Forza, and you have to manually set it off if you want to drive for yourself. I don't need to give dozens more examples. Uncharted, The Last of Us, the 3D Fallout games, Red Dead Redemption, Bioshock, you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. I don't need to explain this to you guys. You know exactly what games are now, for better or worse, and you know about live services, you know about the endless treadmills games sometimes set you on. You expect big budget, big open, immersive worlds that are littered with small quests, small NPCs, and just tons of detail. And more or less games like that are expected to be a theme park. Games are fundamentally a different experience than they ever were. Getting to the end of a game, if it even has one, isn't usually a matter of skill now so much as it is a matter of whether you'll put in enough time to see the story to the end. At least for the average game. Remember, we're talking in very broad strokes here to paint entire eras. Obviously, in the online era, online play is a big defining feature too. Yeah, Xbox Live and PlayStation 2 Online existed before this era, and PC games have been online forever, 
but it wouldn't be weird if you owned an Xbox and didn't have Xbox Live, or if you never hooked up your PS2 to play Amplitude online. If you had an Xbox 360 without Xbox Live or without hooking it up to the internet, like, what were you even doing? It's practically a required part of owning the console. Oh yeah, and you could download video games now? Have you heard of Steam? Guess what, they're gonna publish third-party games now, and oh look, the entire market for physical PC games is dead. It wasn't too long before most people don't even put disk drives in their gaming PCs after this. And there's all these cool, new, smaller console games that you would typically never see before. And they only cost $5 to $10. Oh, sorry, I'm getting an update. And they only cost $10 to $20 now. Have I mentioned microtransactions and that games are all about getting money from the player now? So much so that many big games are just released for free. Speaking of terrible free games, in 2007 the Apple iPhone was released, shortly followed by Android, ushering in the biggest deluge of free-to-play garbage the gaming world would ever know. It's also pretty much expected to be able to play old games on new consoles, and I don't mean through backwards compatibility. In 2004, the original Xbox Live Arcade launched, with a bunch of arcade games, but no one really cared about that. I'm talking 2006. Virtual console. I'm talking about how you don't get NES games in Animal Crossing anymore. You buy them individually for five bucks a piece. Need an incentive to subscribe to Nintendo's pointless Switch Online service? Here, have some NES games. We fucked up the 3DS launch? Here, have some GBA games, you ambassador you. Uncharted? Remastered. Sly Cooper? Remastered. Every single Wii U game? Remastered. God of War 3? Remastered. Why? Why was this released as a standalone game? I just don't get it. If you want to play Legacy of Kain's Soul Reaver, you used to either break out your PS1 or go to Steam and spend seven bucks to play it. Now you go and post on social media about, oh, what a gem that game was, and I'd play it again if they'd only poured it to the latest home video game boxes. Boy, I wish they would poorly up these graphics that completely ruined the charming art style of the original game. Uh-oh, I'm, I'm opining, I'm sorry. Another kind of weird change in the modern era is that I see a shift to games with realistic graphics and human characters. Which, and again, I'm trying to pass as little judgment as possible in this video, and I'm failing. It's maybe a little boring? It's not like human characters were ever rare in video games. I guess humans like games about humans. But look at the variety of art styles and character designs in a major PlayStation game. Solid Snake looks nothing like Cloud, and neither of them certainly resemble Parappa, Spyro, Crash, Sweet Tooth, or going on to PS2, Ratchet and Clank, Sly Cooper, Okami, Kratos, or Jack and Daxter. If you look at the top games of the past few years, I think they're overwhelmingly human characters in realistic settings, or at least fantasy settings with realistic graphics. And yeah, there's the odd, more unique game like Untitled Goose Game or Cuphead thrown in. There are way, way more games than ever before, so you can certainly find whatever weird bullshit you're into. So maybe this only applies to the big budget releases, but it is something I very much notice. And really, since 2005 or so, I don't think games have changed significantly enough to usher in a new era. Even the new console generations feel like they blend together with incremental upgrades, rather than becoming a bold new way to play games. We certainly have better graphics, but I don't think they've been truly jaw-dropping, life-changing graphics since maybe Crisis or Bioshock. New genres have come up in this era, crafting games, idle games, battle royales, but nothing that's really shaken up the video game industry as a whole into something new. At this point, I'm not really sure what's going to usher in the next era of video games. Where are video games going? Is it VR? I don't think so. It certainly wasn't motion controls. Maybe new home video game consoles will stop being a thing in the future, and technology will somehow make upgrading entire boxes every few years obsolete. Not to be too down on the state of games, but sometimes it feels like the industry as a whole right now is just coasting on existing ideas and existing IP. Have we discovered every genre already? I don't think so. I'm playing lots of unique stuff, from Her Story to The Witness to Papers, Please, but those games aren't exactly changing the face of the industry. But I don't think the industry is going to stay this way forever. Or at least I certainly hope not. I know I felt a similar way in the 2000s when we had a never-ending stream of military first-person shooters, and I think that finally ended. I think. And, oh geez, this video is really long. I wasn't trying to go over the history of video games, or talk about how much I'm kinda disappointed in the modern gaming era. I just wanted to explain why I mentally chunk gaming history into these four eras right now. It's perfect. And if you disagree, and you think it looks like this, well, fuck you, buddy. Do you even play video games? Do you understand the L-